Chapter 21 of The Sleeper Awakes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ryan Sutter. The Sleeper Awakes by H. G. Wells. Chapter 21 The Underside. From the business quarter they presently passed by the running ways into a remote quarter of the city, where the bulk of the manufactures was done. On their way the platform crossed the Thames twice, and passed in a broad viaduct across one of the great roads that entered the city from the north. In both cases his impression was swift and in both very vivid. The river was a broad, wrinkled glitter of black sea-water overarched by buildings and vanishing, either way, into a blackness starred with receding lights. A string of black barges passed seaward, manned by blue-clad men. The road was a long and very broad and high tunnel along which big-wheeled machines drove noiselessly and swiftly. Here, too, the distinctive blue of the Labor Department was in abundance. The smoothness of the double tracks, the largeness and the lightness of the big pneumatic wheels in proportion to the vehicle, vehicular body struck Graham most vividly. One lank and very high carriage with longitudinal metallic rods hung with the dripping carcasses of many hundred sheep arrested his attention unduly. Abruptly, the edge of the archway cut and blotted out the picture. Presently they left the way, and descended by a lift and traversed a passage that sloped downward, and so came to a descending lift again. The appearance of things changed. Even the pretense of architectural ornament disappeared. The lights diminished in number and size. The architecture became more and more massive in proportion to the spaces as the factory quarters were reached, and in the dusty, biscuit-making place of the potters, among the felspar mills, in the furnace rooms of the metal workers, among the incandescent lakes of crude Edomite, the blue canvas clothing was on man, woman, and child. Many of these great and dusty galleries were silent avenues of machinery, Endless, raked-out ashen furnaces testified to the revolutionary dislocation, but wherever there was work it was being done by slow-moving workers in blue canvas. The only people not in blue canvas were the overlookers of the workplaces and the orange-clad labor police. And fresh from the flushed faces of the dancing halls, the voluntary vigors of the business quarter, Graham could note the pinched faces the feeble muscles, and weary eyes of many of the latter-day workers. Such as he saw at work were noticeably inferior in physique to the few gaily-dressed managers and forewomen who were directing their labors. The burly laborers of the old Victorian times had followed that dray horse and all such living force producers to extinction. The place of his costly muscles was taken by some dexterous machine. The latter-day laborer, male as well as female, was essentially a machine-minder and feeder, a servant and attendant, or an artist under direction. The women, in comparison with those Graham remembered, were as a class distinctly plain and flat-chested. Two hundred years of emancipation from the moral restraints of puritanical religion, two hundred years of city life, had done their work in eliminating the strain of feminine beauty and vigor from the blue canvas myriads. To be brilliant physically or mentally, to be in any way attractive or exceptional, had been and was still a certain way of emancipation to the drudge, a line of escape to the pleasure city and its splendors and delights, and at last to the euthanasy and peace. To be steadfast against such inducements was scarcely to be expected of meanly nourished souls. In the young cities of Graham's former life, the newly aggregated laboring mass had been a diverse multitude, still stirred by the tradition of personal honor and a high morality. Now it was differentiating into an indistinct class with a moral and physical difference of its own, even with a dialect of its own. They penetrated downward, ever downward, towards the working places. Presently they passed underneath one of the streets of the moving ways and saw its platforms running on their rails far overhead and chinks of white lights between the transverse slits. The factories that were not working were sparsely lighted. To Graham, they and their shrouded aisles of giant machines seemed plunged in gloom, and even where work was going on the illumination was far less brilliant than upon the public ways. Beyond the blazing lakes of Edomite, 
he came to the warren of the jewellers and with some difficulty and by using his signature obtained admission to these galleries they were high and dark and rather cold in the first a few men were making ornaments of gold filigree each man at a little bench by himself and with a little shaded light the long vista of light patches, with the nimble fingers brightly lit and moving among the gleaming yellow coils, and the intent face, like the face of a ghost in each shadow, had the oddest effect. The work was beautifully executed, but without any strength of modeling or drawing, for the most part intricate grotesques or the ringing of the changes on a geometrical motif. These workers wore a peculiar white uniform, without pockets or sleeves, they assumed this on coming to work, but at night they were stripped and examined before they left the premises of the department. In spite of every precaution the labor policeman told them in a depressed tone, the department was not infrequently robbed. Beyond was a gallery of women busied in cutting and setting slabs of artificial ruby, and next to these were men and women working together upon the slabs of copper net that formed the basis of cloisonne tiles. Many of these workers had lips and nostrils a livid white due to a disease caused by a peculiar purple enamel that chanced to be much in fashion. Asano apologized to Graham for this offensive sight, but excused himself on the score of the convenience of this route. This is what I wanted to see, said Graham. This is what I wanted to see, trying to avoid a start at a particularly striking disfigurement. She might have done better with herself than that, said Asano. Graham made some indignant comments. "'But, sire, we simply could not stand that stuff without the purple,' said Asano. "'In your days people could stand such crudities. They were nearer the barbaric by two hundred years.' They continued along one of the lower galleries of this cloisonne factory, and came to a little bridge that spanned a vault. Looking over the parapet, Graham saw that beneath was a wharf under yet more tremendous archings than any he had seen. Three barges, smothered in flowery dust, were being unloaded of their cargoes of powdered felspar by a multitude of coughing men, each guiding a little truck. The dust filled the place with a choking mist and turned the electric glare yellow. The vague shadows of these workers gesticulated about their feet and rushed to and fro against a long stretch of whitewashed wall. Every now and then one would stop to cough. A shadowy, huge mass of masonry rising out of the inky water brought to Graham's mind the thought of the multitude of ways and galleries and lifts that rose floor above floor overhead between him and the sky. The men worked in a silence under the supervision of two of the labor police. Their feet made a hollow thunder on the planks along which they went to and fro. And as he looked at this scene, some hidden voice in the darkness began to sing. "'Stop that!' shouted one of the policemen, but the order was disobeyed, and first one and then all the white-stained men who were working there had taken up the beating refrain, singing it defiantly, the song of the revolt. The feet upon the planks thundered now to the rhythm of the song, tramp, tramp, tramp. The policeman who had shouted glanced at his fellow, and Graham saw him shrug his shoulders. He made no further effort to stop the singing. And so... They went through these factories and places of toil, seeing many painful and grim things. That walk left on Graham's mind a maze of memories, fluctuating pictures of swathed halls and crowded vaults seen through clouds of dust, of intricate machines, the racing threads of looms, the heavy beat of stamping machinery, the roar and rattle of belt and armature, of ill-lit subterranean aisles of sleeping places, illimitable vistas of pinpoint lights. Here was the smell of tanning, and here the reek of a brewery, and here unprecedented reeks, Everywhere were pillars and cross-archings of such a massiveness as Graham had never before seen, thick titans of greasy, shining brickwork crushed beneath the vast weight of that complex city world, even as these anemic millions were crushed by its complexity. And everywhere were pale features, lean limbs, disfigurement, and degradation. Once and again, and again a third time, Graham heard the song of the revolt during his long, unpleasant research in these places. And once he saw a confused struggle down a passage and learnt that a number of these serfs had seized their bread before their work was done. 
Graham was ascending towards the ways again when he saw a number of blue-clad children running down a transverse passage and presently perceived the reason of their panic in a company of the labor police armed with clubs trotting towards some unknown disturbance. And then came a remote disorder. But for the most part, this remnant that worked, worked hopelessly. All the spirit that was left in fallen humanity was above in the streets that night, calling for the master, and valiantly and noisily keeping its arms. They emerged from these wanderings and stood blinking in the bright light of the middle passage of the platforms again. They became aware of the remote hooting and yelping of the machines of one of the general intelligence offices, and suddenly came men running, and along the platforms and about the ways everywhere was a shouting and crying— then a woman with a face of mute white terror, and another who gasped and shrieked as she ran. "'What has happened now?' said Graham, puzzled, for he could not understand their thick speech. Then he heard it in English, and perceived that the thing that everyone was shouting, that men yelled to one another, that women took up screaming, that was passing like the first breeze of a thunderstorm, chill and sudden through the city, was this. "'Ostrog has ordered the black police to London!' The black police are coming from South Africa. The black police, the black police. Asano's face was white and astonished. He hesitated, looked at Graham's face, and told him the thing he already knew. But how can they know? asked Asano. Graham heard someone shouting, Stop all work! Stop all work! And a swarthy hunchback, ridiculously gay in green and gold, came leaping down the platforms towards him, bawling again and again in good English, "'This is Ostrog's doing! Ostrog the knave! The master is betrayed!' His voice was hoarse, and a thin foam dro dropped from his ugly shouting mouth. He yelled an unspeakable horror that the black police had done in Paris, and so passed, shrieking, "'Ostrog the knave!' For a moment, Graham stood still for it had come upon him again that these things were a dream. He looked up at the great cliff of buildings on either side, vanishing into blue haze at last above the lights, and down to the roaring tiers of platforms and the shouting running people who were gesticulating past. The master is betrayed, they cried. The master is betrayed. Suddenly the situation shaped itself in his mind, real and urgent. His heart began to beat fast and strong. It has come he said. I might have known. The hour has come. He thought swiftly, what am I to do? Go back to the council house, said Asano. Why should I not appeal? The people are here. You will lose time. They will doubt if it is you, but they will mass about the council house. There you will find their leaders. Your strength is there, with them. Suppose this is only a rumor. It sounds true, said Asano. Let us have the facts, said Graham. Asano shrugged his shoulders. We'd better get towards the council house, he cried. That's where they will swarm. Even now the ruins may be impassable. Graham regarded him doubtfully and followed him. They went up the stepped platforms to the swiftest one, and there Asano accosted a laborer. The answers to his questions were in the thick, vulgar speech. What did he say? asked Graham. He knows little, but he told me that the black police would have arrived here before the people knew, had not someone in the Windvane offices learnt. He said, a girl. A girl? Not. He said, a girl. He did not know who she was. Who came out from the council house crying aloud and told the men at work among the ruins? And then another thing was shouted, something that turned in aimless tumult into determinate movements. It came like a wind along the street. To your wards! To your wards! Every man get arms! Every man to his ward! End of chapter 21 Recording by Ryan Sutter RyanSutter.net